Well, good evening. Good evening. I'm Bonnie Thornton Dill. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities, and I want to welcome you to this first event of our 2016 2017 Worldwise Arts and Humanities Dean's Lecture Series. I'm glad to see so many of you gathered here this evening. This is the seventh season for this series where we invite speakers to engage in thought-provoking lectures and conversations about their ideas, their bodies of work, the stories that inform our understanding of what it means to be worldwide in the 21st century. Through these events, we hope to promote community, generate stimulating conversations, they encourage us to think in critical and creative ways, and we hope to facilitate our doing so both on campus and in the community. So our lecture series this semester highlights three authors who demonstrate through their work the impact and relevancy of the humanities on American life. The work of Isabel Wilkerson and Taylor Branch, who will be here in December, and of course our guests tonight, are all innovative work in the arts and humanities, and sh they show the vital need for humanities insights and perspectives in me to have meaningful dialogue and promote historical understandings in today's uh, contemporary issues. Our guest for tonight's conversation is poet and newly awarded MacArthur Fellow, Claudia Ranking. We like to say, we would like to say that we knew she was gonna be a MacArthur Fellow before we invited her, but we certainly thought she deserved it and we're really thrilled that we get a chance to um, uh, um, celebrate that with her this evening. In tonight's conversation, we'll learn more about the role of public education and art in the making of American democracy and further explore what it means to be an American citizen, particularly in a, air quotes, post-racial society. In fact, it's become less post-racial recently, but we'll talk, she'll talk about that. Um, Ms. Ranking will share with us a reading from her best-selling collection of poetry, Citizen, and American Lyric, followed by an intimate and candid conversation with our moderator, Dr. Sherry Parks, Associate Dean for Research, Interdisciplinary Scholarship and Programming in the college. The conversation is of critical importance and relevance to our worldwide conversation, and, we, um, and it also extends the Maryland Dialogues on Race and Equality that began last semester. I want to invite you to join in and participate in the conversation on Twitter, and the hashtag is ARHUDLS, A-R-H-U-D-L-S. And I want to thank the Clarice for partnering with us for this evening's conversation, as well as Maryland Humanities, the Department of English, the Democracy Then and Now Initiative, and the staff of the Dean's Office who work throughout the year to plan and conduct a successful series. So at this time, please join me in welcoming Professor Kimberly Clo Coles, who is chair of the Education and Citizenship Project Committee uh, in the English department and really one of the spear uh, heads of this Democracy Then and Now series. And she's gonna tell you more about this campus-wide initiative. Thank you for coming. Um, it's lovely to see all of you. Um, as you were told, my name is Kim Coles. I am the chair of the planning committee for the campus-wide initiative, Democracy Then and Now, Citizenship in Public Education. Democracy Then and Now is a two-month speaker series that's ongoing until November 7th. The purpose of the series is to ask students, faculty, and staff to consider the origins of public education in this country as it was conceived by the educational and political founders as an instrument for honing the public citizen. Then, to think about the state of public education now, who uh, receives a good public education, and what are the consequences of the receipt of a poor one in terms of citizenship rights, civic participation, and political representation. 
I can think of no one better to put at the center of this series than tonight's guest speaker, Claudia Rankin, author of Citizen, an American Lyric. I want to thank um, the Arts and Humanities uh, Dean's Office, the Dean uh, in particular, Bonnie Thornton Dill, the Associate Dean Sherry Parks for partnering, for, excuse me, partnering with us to bring her to campus, and Maryland Humanities, uh, without whose generous support it would not have been possible. Um, and here to introduce her properly is Distinguished University Professor Mary Helen Washington. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here to introduce my friend and uh, colleague. I will begin with some of the facts about Claudia Rankin's interesting and brilliant career. Rankin was born in Jamaica in, 18, in uh, 1963. <laughs> Pardon me, Claudia. 1963. She earned her BA in English from Williams College and her MFA in poetry from Columbia University. Rankin will join the Yale faculty this fall as the Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry. She is the author of five collections of poetry, including Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American Lyric, Plot, The End of the Alphabet, Nothing in Nature is Private, and Citizen, an American Lyric. She is the most recent winner of the prestigious Jackson Poetry Prize and has received fellowships from the Academy of American Poetry, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Citizen was a finalist for a 2014 National Book Award. And just this past week, Rankin became one of the 23 people chosen by the MacArthur Foundation as a 2016 MacArthur Fellow. And this is the fact that I want to stop on. Because what gets obscured about the MacArthur Awards is the media's attention on, it's all about the Benjamins, is that the MacArthur Fellows are chosen for, and I'm quoting, breaking new ground in areas of public concern in the arts and in the sciences, often in unexpected ways. When she was interviewed about the award, Rankin's response was, as we have come now to expect, unexpected. She said she intends to use that grant to set up a, quote, racial imaginary institute, which would enable creative thinkers to come together in a kind of laboratory environment to talk about the making of art and culture and about dismantling white dominance. The unexpected is what we have come to expect in Rankin's poetry. The subtitles of her two recent books is An American Lyric. But if we think about the lyric as poetry about individual and private concerns, Rankin counters that expectation. She is creating a community of readers and voices and artists. First, there is the, the, the very community that she creates in her texts of visual artists, filmmakers, playwrights, other poets, and voices from many communities, often <coughs> subjects that have not been considered appropriate for poetry. I see that community in the way her work creates connections in our own department and programs on, on campus. My colleagues who teach Renaissance literature, Victorian, medieval, people in the film department, art history, the performing arts, are all reading and talking about Citizen. Then another community, we consider the 150,000 readers who have helped to put this book on the New York Times bestseller list. There is also a virtual community she created. A few months ago, there were hundreds of people, including my relatives and friends, telephoning, texting, and tweeting about a big commotion at a political rally 
when the television camera spotted a young black woman reading Citizen. That was probably the first time a Trump rally was disrupted by poetry. <laughs> I think of Rankin's subtitles and American lyric as her challenge to what is expected in American lyric poetry. In the traditional lyric poem, you might be expecting a Grecian urn or a field of daffodils, all beautiful and necessary. But you might not be expecting the voices and subjects of Rankin's lyrics. Serena and Venus, Trayvon, Eric, Jordan, Michael, and Sandra, Zinedine Zidane, the Rutgers University William women's basketball team, James Anderson, lynching, Hurricane Katrina, or black hoodies. Rankin reminds us that she belongs in the tradition of poets like Hughes and Brooks, Baraka, Clifton, and Whitman, who also violated the taboo that art is supposed to remain outside of the territory of the political. I think of Rankin as our 21st century's fearless poet, unsettling the territory between poetry and social critique, calling into question the possibilities for what poetry can be, expanding our notions of what counts as aesthetic beauty, and in the process, extending American poetry in exciting, new, and unexpected directions. Please welcome Claudia Rankin. Good afternoon. Or is it evening? Is it, I think it's evening. I'm going to call it evening. Um, it's such an honor to be here, uh, especially on the 100th anniversary of the publication of Democracy and Education by um, John Dewey. The, I, I wanted to start by reading the final um, paragraph in this as a kickoff. He writes, school becomes a form of social life, a miniature community, and one in close interaction with other modes of associated experiences beyond school walls. All education which develops power to share effectively in social life is moral. It forms a character which not only does the particular deed socially necessary, but one which is interested in that continuous readjustment with it, which is essentially to grow. Interest in learning from all the contacts of life is the essential moral interest. I wanted to start there because it seemed to me this idea of um, Tying democracy to education is especially crucial now. We're a month away, and it is in your hands what happens to us as a, a, a citizens together in this country, as Americans. Um, so I'll leave it there. I, I will read um, for half an hour. I, like, I, I, I don't know about you, but I like when people tell me where I'm going. Um, so I'm going to read for half an hour, and then we're going to have a conversation. I will start. <laughs> Oops. I didn't want to start with him. But since he talks automatically, <laughs> I will begin. Um, Citizen is broken up into seven sections, 
And the final piece in the first section um, was a story told to me by a friend of mine who is a professor in Northern California. And I asked her to tell me a moment when she was doing something ordinary or something she thought was sort of, in some sense, run of the mill, and suddenly racism um, derailed that moment in a way that she will never forget. So I'll read you the piece, the, the, the piece that I wrote from what she told me. The new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken on the phone. Her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with the deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house, what are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman pincher or German shepherd has gained the power of speech. And though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment? She spits back. Then she pauses. Everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by Oh yes, that's right, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. So I, I asked my friend um, what happened next and she said that uh, she went to the appointment with this woman and, um, and after the appointment she went home and she broke down in tears and she wrote the the therapist and said, you know, I won't be coming back. So as I was thinking about the, the therapist, I thought, oh, I, I described her as a wounded Doberman pincher. So then I began to think, if she's a Doberman pincher, what is my friend? And that's when I remembered this piece of art by Kate Clark. It's, um, She's an artist who does taxidermy. She actually buys hide and stuffs it and um, casts face and attaches. And so I contacted her and I asked her if I could buy the rights to reproduce that image inside the book. And she said to me, um, why don't you send me the book and maybe you can commission a new piece for the book. And I thought, oh, that sounds exciting, why not? And so that's what happened. I sent her the book and I commissioned, she let me pick out the hide, I picked out the hide of that, that kind of figure on the left. And then, you know, after months passed, I went to her studio and she said, I've done the, I, I did this because I read the book and I found the book very painful. And I wanted to present an image of um, a black woman who was proud and regal. And I said, well, I don't want that. And she said, well, why not? And I said, well, because that's not what negotiating racism day in and day out actually feels like. It feels like that. It, you feel defeated. You feel knocked back. And so I ended up using the first image, but I had bought the rights to the second, so I put it in another book. <laughs> Waste not, want not, right? <laughs> but one of the th things I was thinking about when I was thinking about what it meant to um, portray black people as deer was 
the long history we have of being called animals, right? Of blacks being called gorillas, being called. And then just um, to support me, this happened. Fucking lazy monkeys. Maybe the tenth one I've seen in my life, too. They all look the same to me. That guy um, was speaking to a black cameraman. So the cameraman uh, filmed him saying what he was saying to him. This was in the last year. And then he put it on, on YouTube. So you can always go there if you think I'm making any of this up. I'm, I'm big on evidence. Um, Here's an other examples of Kate Clark's work. I really am fond of the one on the left. This is Jason Massoon. I don't know, have you seen his um, videos, uh, Art Thoughts by Jason Massoon? Um, how to become a successful white audience, white artist, be white. How to become a successful black artist. Be angry. What does a victorious or defeated black woman's body in a historically white space look like? Serena and her big sister Venus Williams brought to mind Zora Neale Hurston's I feel most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. This appropriated line stenciled on canvas by Glenn Ligon, who used plastic letter stencils, smudging oil sticks, and graphite to transform the words into abstractions, seemed to be ad copy for some aspect of life for all black bodies. Hurston's statement has been played out on the big screen by Serena and Venus. They win sometimes, they lose sometimes, they've been injured, they've been happy, they've been sad, ignored, booed mightily, see Indian wells. They've been cheered, and through it all, and evident to all, were those people who were enraged that they were there at all, graphite against a sharp white background. For years, you attribute to Serena Williams a kind of resilience appropriate only to those who exist in celluloid. Neither her father, nor her mother, nor her sister, nor Jehovah her God, nor Nike Camp could shield her ultimately from people who felt her black body didn't belong on their court, in their world. From the start, many made it clear Serena would have done better struggling to survive in the two-dimensionality of a millet painting rather than on their tennis court. Better to put all that strength to work in their fantasy of her working the land, rather than be caught up in the turbulence of our ancient dramas, like a ship fighting a storm in a Turner seascape. So one of the reasons why Citizen is so problematic in terms of its genre is that inside in section two, there's this essay on Serena. And inside the essay are these images by Nick Cave. He makes what he calls sound suits. He was originally an Alvin Ailey dancer, and then he went on to make these. And when I first saw Nick Cave sound suits, how many of you are familiar with his, his sound suits? Oh, okay, so I am bringing something to you. I'm very happy about that. Um, he's a fantastic, fantastic artist, contemporary artist. Um, and he makes these suits, they cover you from head to foot. And um, they did a, a piece in Grand Central Station, actually, where people had the sound suits on. And they're now in the Met in the costume gallery. But when I first saw them, I thought, why would somebody do that? 
why would you make something that covered all of you? Maybe I'm secretly claustrophobic, but I, I thought, why did he do that? And so I started reading everything that he had written um, to try and find the justification. And now he talks about it in broad strokes. But after a lot of research, I tracked down this piece. It was in an old um, interview. He says, I was thinking about, well, you know, I'm a black male. I know what it's like to feel discarded, dismissed, devalued. You know, the moment I leave my house, I could be a victim of circumstances. You just never know. I looked down and saw a twig, something that I walk on, something that I dismiss. And it just sort of clicked while mediating on the media portrayal of Rodney King, larger than life, 10 men to bring him down. What does that look like in my head? It ended up looking like a suit made of twigs. I drilled holes in the delicate tree parts to create a massive object. But I didn't even think I could put it on my body. And then once I stepped into it, I thought about building this sort of second skin, you know, a suit of armor, something for protection purposes. Then I started thinking about protest in order to be heard. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to speak louder. You have got to make sound. So that was the original justification for making those suits. I have a clicker, but I'm not using it. I am just pressing these buttons. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves, were rescued. Then there are these days each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through these brothers, each brother, my brother, Dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart, your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets, and as yet I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother, I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, another dawn, where the pink sky is a bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless shush. Those years of and before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling, of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony, accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging. The rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots, our limbs, our throat slice through. And when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms, oh blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, dear brother, that kind of blue. The sky is a silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking. The talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot. Is it cold? 
Are you cold? It does get cool. Is it cool? Are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is a silence. Eventually, he says, it is raining. It is raining down. It was raining. It stopped raining. It is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there. He's there. But he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. That piece is followed by this image of the lynching of Thomas Schiff and Abram Schiff, Smith um, in Marion, Indiana, 1930. Um, when I called to get the rights for this image from Getty, they told me I couldn't buy the rights. And, you know, that's annoying. Um, so I, I called them back the next day thinking I would get somebody else and she would be a little bit, you know. And so I called back, I did, I did do this, I'm, you know. And I called back and I, I asked and she said, the person who answered the next day said, no, we can't sell you the rights because we are an intermediary for Hilton Archives who owns the right to the image. And they are afraid that the people who want to buy the rights to this want to in order to support what is in the image. And so it was one of those, yeah, I don't know if you have these kind of moments where you're hearing but you're not hearing. So each word is landing one at a time in my head, wanting to support what is in the image. And then I realize, I'm like, oh, I'm not a white supremacist. I might be able to make a case. So, <laughs> <laughs> difficult one, but. So I, I asked them if I could send them the book and if they could send it on to Holton Archives. And, um, and that's what happened. And then they came back and said, okay. They said, you can have the rights. So I paid my $500 and then I called them back. And they were like, you again? No, no, no. <laughs> no they didn't say that. But um, I called them back and I said, um, there's one other thing. Is it okay if I take out the men? Because I think we like to think, we get distracted by the spectacle and forget about the real problem. And the problem are those people who are actually you people, right? Um, people who have come up inside a culture based on um, the premise of white supremacy and um, have lived their lives with the privileges that that orientation has allowed, which is why the murder of black people is continuing because it doesn't really, in, in some people's estimate, touch their lives. Um, I'm going to play a video now. Between us, between strangers, our civic contract states, we will act in each other's best interest for no other reason than we are here together. Beaver Creek 911, where's your emergency? I'm at the uh, Beaver Creek Walmart. There's a uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. Is he got it pulled out? Yeah, he's like pointing at people. What does he look like? He's a black male, probably about six foot tall. Okay, what's he wearing? Um, Blue shirt, blue pants. Where is he at now? He's over in the pet. Can I have your name, please? My name is Ronald Ritchie. The alliance we pledged is to one another. Assurance is taken. Can I trust you? Assurance is taken. Different from and similar to 
each other. Sir, what's going on? Gunshot to the store. Police officers are here. They're on the scene. All right. You got any shots fired? Start an ambulance. Whatever the precise thinking behind the question, the question is asked deep within us. We recognize that inevitably I am going to have to put my trust in you. Stop. Listen to me. Okay. Listen to me. Okay. Radio 12 out that subject, uh, the salvage mission. Walking by and doing what? Well, you're making people nervous. By walking by? Yeah, they said you had your hands in your pockets. Wow, walking by having your hands in your pockets makes people nervous to call the police when it's snowing outside? They did. Okay. So are you okay? I'm fine. How about you? I'm good. All right. Uh, what are you up to today? Walking with my hands in my pockets, walking. Get your license, please. Get out of the car! Get out of the car! Get out of the ground! Get out of the ground! I just got my license! You're taking my license! I got my license right there! That's my license right there! Put your hands behind your back! 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 What did I do, son? Are you hit? I think so. I can't feel my leg. I don't know what happened. I just grabbed my leg. Rachel on 866, I need a 1052. Why did you, why did you shoot me? We got pulled over for a busted tail light in the back. And the police just, he's, he's, he's covered. He they killed my boyfriend. He's licensed, he's carried to, he's licensed to carry. He was trying to get out his ID and his wallet out his um pocket. And he let the officer know that he was, Re he had a firearm and he was reaching for his wallet and the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for a back. I will, sir. No worries. I will. Fuck. He just shot his arm off. We got pulled yeah. over on Larpener. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Please don't oh tell God, me he's dead. Please don't tell me he's dead. Everybody that's tuned in, please pray for us. We're circling the understanding that daily we have to take a leap of faith regarding you. In order that we can go on believing in our mobility, trust is what pledging and allegiance secures. Public trust relies on both an implicit understanding and a mode of seeing. Someone is paying attention. Someone is watching. See? Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. They got the gun. Drop it, bro. Oh, they just killed this man. Damn. If you see something, say something. Because we will trust you. Peace of mind gives us the ability to move through our day without fear. It keeps us 
in our rhythms. It gives us an air of confidence regarding an illusory control of the world around us. We understand what will happen next. And this is crucial to a sense of well-being, even if this control is no control at all. When something occurs that disallows the taking for granted of one's own safety, when something happens, when that thing happens. So what's your business with me right now? I want to find out who you are and, and what the problem was. There is no problem. That's the thing. So talk to me. Let me and know let who you are. know. You Why do I have to let you know who I am? To let who I am isn't because the problem. Because that's what police do when they get called. But I don't have to let you. People. Well, I know my rights. First off. Secondly. Okay. Secondly, okay. I don't have to let you know who I am if I hadn't broken any laws. I told, like I told him, I'm going to New Horizons to pick up my kids at 10 o'clock. I was sitting there for 10 minutes. <laughs> Fully. Like, not before he walked Thank up to me or anything. He walked up to me a minute after and got irate with me. So first off, that's a public area. And if there's no sign that doesn't say this is a private area, you can't sit here, no one can tell me I can't sit there. If that's the case, then I can't sit here. There is no, the problem is I'm black. That's the problem. We might find discomfort in loss of comfort. We might lose an ease of movement around another, the perceived inability to trust another. No one wishes his or her sense of trust violated. Each time we pass through our public spaces, the question presents as a gentle nudge against an unconscious reliance on public trust. Would you, could you, should you trust? Step out of the car. Do not have the right to do that. I do have the right. Now step out or I will remove you. I refuse to talk to you other than to identify myself. Step out or I will remove you. I am getting removed for a failure. Step out or I will remove you. I'm giving you a lawful order. Get out of the car now or I'm going to remove you. And I'm calling my I'm going to yank you out of here. Okay, you're going to yank me out of my car? Get out. Okay, all right. As we daily move through our streets, in our parks, across bridges, in the aisles of stores, anywhere and everywhere we live, a simple truth and a basic understanding exists. When I walk toward you, it's one of the reasons I'm interested in. As we turn to each other, it's one of the reasons I'm interested in. Each second inside our unspoken question is one of the reasons I'm interested in.
I'm going to end um, with a poem that's not in Citizen. But before I read that, I want to read a quote from um, Jill Starbert in her book, Ethical Loneliness. She writes, ethical loneliness is the isolation one feels when one as a violated person or as one member of a persecuted group has been abandoned by humanity or by those who have power over one's life possibilities. Okay. Sound and fury. Dispossess, despair, depression, despondent, dejection. The doom is the off-white of white. But wait. White can't know what white feels. Where's the life in that? Where's the right in that? Where's the white in that? At the bone of bone white breeds the fear of seeing, the frustration of being unequal to white. White male portraits on white walls were intended to mean ownership of all, the privilege of all, even as white walls white in. And this is understandable, yes. Understandable because the culture claims white owns everything. The world of no one anyone knows. Still the equation holds. Jobs and health and schools and better than before and different from now and enough and always and eventually mine. This is what it means to wear a color and believe the embrace of its touch. What white long expected was to work its way into an upwardly mobile fit. In the old days, white included a life, even without luck or chance of birth. The scaffolding had rungs and legacy and the myth of meritocracy fixed in white. Now white can't hold itself distant from the day's touch. Even as the touch holds so little, white would own. Foreclosure, vanished pension, school systems in disrepair, free trade rising, unemployment, unpaid medical bills, school debt, car debt, debt, debt. White is living its brick and mortar life, staving off more loss, exhaustion, aggrieved exposure, a pale heart, even as in daylight, white hardens its features. Eyes which old all the light harden, jaws which close down on nothing harden, hands which assembled and packaged and built harden into a fury that cannot call power to account. Though it's not untrue, jobs were outsourced, and it's not untrue, an economic base was cut out from under. It's not untrue. If people could just come clean about their pain, the being at a loss when just being white is not working. Who said there is no hierarchy inside white walls? Who implied white owns everything even as it owns nothing? But white can't strike its own structure. White can't oust its own system. All the loss is nothing next to any other who can be thrown out. In daylight, this right to righteous rage doubles down the supremacy 
of white in our way. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would have worn heels if I knew I was going to sit here. <laughs> People on the front row are used to looking at the bottom of feet. It's okay. First, thank you for that. This is not easy work. Um, tell me why you do it. That is, that, that is a hard question. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a new question, why I do it. I, I think that it is for me um, a way of understanding the dynamics of the life that I'm living. And easy or not, that is the dynamic, this, this, this um, oppressive... Um, existence, no matter how successful one is, that one has to negotiate in one's life. So to, why I do it, I do it because it is a question of my life. It is something I have to negotiate. It's something that we all have to negotiate, no matter what race we are. Um, and um, it's interesting for me to try and bring language to experience. Um, because it, I'm taken by your choosing to stay in that moment of pain. You talked about the artist who immediately wanted to move up to the proud image, mm -hmm. and you said, that's not what I want. So you're, you are forcing yourself to stay over and over, night after night, in that moment of pain, and, and that's brave work. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be recognized as that. You've written about being a middle-class intellectual woman, black woman, and there are lots of them in the room. And can you talk about that, the quote, I'm gonna read one of your own quotes back to you just so that um, they achieve themselves to death trying to dodge the buildup of erasure. Can you talk about what it means to be a very successful black woman and yet to go through your life, our lives, like your friend who was going to the therapist and that, because I think most of us don't put it into language as a form of survival mm -hmm. and you've taken on that job. Can you talk about what it means to be as successful as you are and to carry that pain? Well, you know, I, um, in my, you know, perhaps I am successful. I think by any measure you are. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but in my life, I feel like all of us, uh, like a person negotiating the day. And, you know, when I do look at people who I, who I feel are successful, um, like Serena Williams, for example, or like, um, like Michelle Obama, for example, um, our first lady, there is that way in which I'm very interested in what it means for black women, successful black women, who um, have done everything the society says you're supposed to do, you know, and, um, and to have them still be subject to the kind of disgraceful language that we've seen publicly around, around these incredible women. And these are women um, who are, um, what I love about both of those women is that those, both of those women do not dodge the attempts to erase them. They address them. 
and um, and they come forward in their full in the fullness of who they are in terms of their sexuality, in terms of their um, desire, in terms of their mastery of of whatever they're doing, their professionalism. So I was I was really interested in in um, writing about what that looks like um, as something to model as well as um, to be flabbergasted by. You know, there's, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a magazine that has um, Michelle Obama, the first lady on it, on the newsstands right now. And I bought, I was in an airport, I was at Newark, and I saw it, and I bought the magazine. And I'm at the, I'm paying for it, and the man at the counter says to me, she looks good in that dress. And I said, yeah, she's a beautiful woman. He said, no, she looks good in that dress. And I said, yeah, she's a beautiful woman. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, she looks good in the dress. So even in that moment, it's like we, I, you know, you're fighting to claim the place and he is fighting to keep you out. You use the word, the pronoun you a lot just now, and you're working to refocus this picture, to put the focus in, as in the lynching photograph, when you, you take the, the black men out so that we focus on the spectators, the celebrators. Elsewhere, you've written about the changing the racial imaginary to, what is the strength of poetry to change the racial imaginary, that default category procedure, structure that you've talked about? Well, I think everything in the culture um, has very consciously been structured to privilege whiteness. Um, you know, I was just, this is, this is a roundabout answer, as it always is when it's coming out of my mouth, but... Um, <laughs> Take your time. But I was just in um, uh, Ohio at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. The population of that prison was 80% white women, 19% um, black women, 1% other. So we took a picture of the women from the back and pretty much in the entire picture, all you saw were varying degrees of blonde hair depending on how long they'd been in prison. And so then I took that photo and I showed it to a room full of white people and I said, what is this photo? And I sent around pieces of paper and they all wrote down what they thought they were looking at. And then I read back to them what they wrote. So this room, it was a room of women in the prison from the back, they're all wearing the same um, clothes, obviously, and there's an American flag in the front of the room. What I was told that this room full of white people saw was a church group, um, some kind of like Girl Scout committee meeting for leaders, um, and everything but a prison. And that's how deep our society and how hard the society has worked to keep images away from the public that don't um, support this notion of, of white beauty, white privilege, white greatness, white intelligence, etc. So there, there is I mean, it's not accidental. There is work being done all the time. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how, through language, we can bring back what, you know, what is actually real, rather than this constructed society where white dominance has to stay in place at all costs. And for me, poetry, is my medium, and it is a medium that allows in f 
feeling, which is why I love it, that um, it's not just uh, an intellectual space, it's a space that brings one's values, one's own experiences and one's own feelings inside of the genre. And I think that if we begin to investigate the ways in which we language has co-opted us inside um, the insistence on white supremacy and begin to kind of dismantle that, we might get back to a place where human beings can just be human beings. When did you know you were a poet? There's been some writing that suggests that we are all poets when we are children and that for many people it falls away, they forget, they move away. How old were you when you were a poet? When you were a poet? Well, we all have the capacity to, um, to have thoughts and express our innermost thoughts. But then poetry, like any other discipline, takes um, a little bit of work. And um, so I, I think when I was, I know when I was a sophomore in college, I took a class in which I read um, the work of Adrian Rich. And I remember thinking this work, these poems, Diving Into the Wreck, um, specifically, uh, these poems are close to what I would like to say, but they're not saying what I need to say. I think I could do it better. I mean, that was, you know, the, because I was a sophomore. I <laughs> so I believed I could do it better. So I, the next semester, because, hey, I, democracy and education, there it is. Um, I, I signed up for, for a writing class, and then it was a long battle to figure out how to get the words to do what you want them to do. But, um, but that was the first moment. I don't, think, I don't think I declared myself a poet until perhaps 10 years later. I was in graduate school, and um, I was taking a class on, um, I think, the modernist poets, and um, the professor asked me to stay after class, and I thought, oh God, you know, what did I do? And he said to me, I know you're in that writing program, but you should be in this PhD program. And he said, I can, I can fix it, we'll, we'll do it, and get you moved over here. And at that moment, I thought, no, I am in the program I want to be in. I'm a poet. And that was the first time that I decided, oh, you're just going to be poor. That's what's going <laughs> to happen. <laughs> so it's a good thing I won the MacArthur. <laughs> but, but there it is again. He had decided what you should do, and he, had, he was already going to, quote, fix it and pull you over into what his imagination mm -hmm, said for mm -hmm. you. So you were already pushing back. Um, there is this meta discussion going on about poetry, whether it, the death of poetry, the death of death of poetry, that happens in elite spaces, which seems to me to be very different than what is happening on the street mm -hmm. uh, with spoken word, with people who are reading your poetry in the middle of, of hostile conventions. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that contradiction, or is it just people who are living on different spheres? I think it is just people, because I think I think poetry is alive now more than ever, um, not just um, in terms of what we're seeing even publicly. There, there are more people have an ability to publish and self-publish and start presses in a way that they didn't before. And so um, I think more poetry is available to be read and being distributed uh, nationally than any other time that I can remember. So I, I think that those kinds of discussions, you know, are, point to a kind of elitism 
in terms of what people consider poetry. Um, and also point to a level of being out of touch in terms of the national scene. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't pay them any. Well, and, and you are in a very interesting position because you are, I mean, she actually has a title of ambassador um, for poetry in, in part of your life, I mean, with the academy. And, and yet you th do all kinds of things in terms of violating what some people would consider poetry. Is genre important to you? I'm not going to ask you whether it's important anymore, but... No, it's not important to me because I think poetry shows up in a lot of places that don't take credit for it. You know, I think um, when I teach my class, I teach um, Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. I teach the Time Passes section from Virginia Woolf. I teach... Um, um, sections from Invisible Man. I mean, there are places where the language moves in an incredibly beautiful way where, where time and um, slippage and things happen that are outside of narrative. And those things happen inside film, um, the work of Chris Marker, Sans Soleil, um, La Jete. Um, there are moments, there are moments everywhere. And when I see them, I collect them, and then I bring them in, and they're as valid to me as poetic moments as a poem by Emily Dickinson or a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. And so, to me, it's a verb that can find its place in, in, in any genre. Breaking down the walls of the academy from Yale. It's basically what you're doing. Am I? I <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a question that I don't usually ask celebrity questions, but you know, everyone today has said, are you going to ask her, are you going to ask her? I have to ask you about the MacArthur and how you felt when you heard you had won the MacArthur Genius Prize. I was happy. <laughs> I, it's funny because I was um, about to do a reading when the phone rang. And, um, and I'm on the phone and, and, and they're talking to me. And the people were like, come on, it's time. And I'm like, I'm coming. <laughs> so. You were happy. Yeah, I was happy. <laughs> As a true poet, very efficient <laughs> use of words. OK, so now we are going to open it up to you. If you've been to our talks before, you know that there are a couple of rules. We are videotaping, so you, if you're going to ask a question, you have to go to one of these two mics. The second rule, and I will enforce this, it has to be a real question, has to be a succinct question, no poetry readings. We've already heard the poetry we're gonna hear this afternoon. No auditions. Um, <laughs> so if you have a question, please ask it now, or, or we'll just keep talking. Okay, nobody has a question right now? Oh, okay, here we have. Hi. Hey. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Avid. I would like to ask how you feel about some of the discussions that are being had about whether or not it's, um, a, whether or not it's a okay or, or beneficial to release the videos of, of police violence with black people. Like some people obviously want it to be seen so that people know what happened and then some people think that it's just re-traumatizing and I'm sure that it's probably a combination of all of these but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. I, um, one of the reasons we put before the video the advisory is to allow people to make a choice um, whether or not they want to view it. I, you know, I wrote a piece for the New York Times on mourning, and um, 
And how important it was when Emma Till's mother opened that casket, how important it was for the civil rights movement and the American public at large. I think, I understand that people feel that to watch these again and again are triggering, it um, could be considered a kind of um, trauma, you know, inflicting exercise. But for me, I think that as viewers, when I watch those videos, what I'm seeing, what I'm paying attention to is white rage. And unfortunately, we cannot look at that without seeing the death. But if we don't look at the rage, we're never going to be able to dismantle it. Because right now, according to the justice system, it doesn't exist. And there is a confusion around the equation that equates white rage with white fear. So at any point, um, these people can shoot unarmed people and then claim that they were fearful without asking where the fear comes from and what part of it is married to rage. Um, so I know that for many black people watching these videos is uncomfortable, they don't want to see it again. They, they don't, they feel like um, this is their life, why do they have to see it? But I'm not looking at that and I think we need to start looking at, you know, there was a woman on the floor being pummeled by a man who's like twice her weight with the purse sitting right there. That's what I'm looking at. Like, what is that? There's a guy running a woman off the road and then telling her he will light her up. What is that? And then she conveniently ends up dead, apparently from her own hands. Convenient. So that's what I'm seeing, and that's what, you know, I have thought about taking out the bodies in those, but then you don't actually see what's the target. I mean, those men who were carrying that body saying, stand up, walk on your own, he's dead. He's dead. And that they can't even tell a dead black man from a living black man. What is that? So we cannot keep hiding these things away. They need to be put out there. They need to, you know, the guy who claimed that um, the man in the store with pointing guns, we have the video. That was real time. We do not see how come he was not prosecuted for lying. He later said he made that up. So I understand um, that for many people of color, those videos feel traumatizing, but I think we have to start looking at the entire thing and not use the spectacle to give a pass to everything else. Okay. In terms of managing time, we're going to take the questions of everybody who's standing up now, uh, but, but just them. Yes. Hello, uh, Dr. Rankin. No, Claudia. Uh, oh, <laughs> Claudia, thank you. Um, first off, uh, I'm a big fan of your work, um, and I wanted to address the concept of white dominance that uh, you 
purveyed to us during your uh, presentation. Um, myself, my background as being neither uh, white or black, considered white or uh, African American, I would like to know, is by white dominance, are you focusing on the white dominance or the suppression of African Americans specifically? I, I think white dominance. I mean, you, um, as a member outside of whiteness, are probably in some way subject to a past of colonialism, mm -hmm. which is part of that legacy. So, I mean, if we're talking about the black-white situation in the United States right now, yes. We're talking about the rise of the KKK. But, you know, one of the interesting things I did not realize, this is now off your question, I've answered your question, just, but <laughs> uh, one of the things I didn't realize is that the KKK, first, its first formation was after um, the Civil War, right? And it was because um, black people suddenly had governance, they were in the Senate. And this was not tenable, so that it started and then that ended, obviously. But the second formation was against whites. It was against Catholics. Um, that's why the burning cross. And that was 1970 to 1940. The only to, the, the moment that um, Anglo-Saxon whites led in all the other whites was when they then had to um, consolidate um, the power to keep out the blacks. Um, but the first iteration, the first use of the word white was um, in terms of governance. Free white men, which meant Anglo-Saxon white men, to keep away the Italians and the Polish and all of those other people who on their um, immigration cards were called blacks or dark. So they were the first blacks because black people and American Indians weren't even people. So uh, anyway, that's that. I don't know why I thought of that just now, but <laughs> but okay. um, yeah. So I think if you extend it out to colonialism, it's white dominance across the board. Uh, this is actually a good follow-up to that. So one thing I've been talking about amongst friends is decentering whiteness in terms of black liberation. So what is something for you, maybe a personal marker that you can say, like, this to me would be black liberation outside of whiteness? <sighs> black liberation. A, have you read the work of Fred Moten? I would, I would, I, I would um, recommend that. Um, he has a book called The Undercommons, which... Um, I recommend also Robin Kelly. Yeah, I actually saw Robin Kelly yesterday. My oh, dad. you did? Yeah. And what, what was his notion of? Um, kind of thinking that like we don't really need to think about whiteness in terms of liberation at all. Um, he was at Hopkins yesterday, and it was really interesting, but I've always kind of been on that wavelength. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really liked it. No, I know, I, I know he makes that argument. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't agree with him. Because I, I, I feel that we are all here. We're all here. And ideally, that would be nice. But 90% um, of people who hold office right now in the United States are white. 75% of them white men, even though that's 35% of the population. They're not going anywhere. And so we have to deal with it. We have to look at the whole picture. Um, so I, I understand, um, and I'm a great fan of Robin Kelly, and, um, but, I, but I also am a more, pra I'm a Virgo, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just more, I, I'm, they, they're much bigger picture guys. Mm -hmm. And I'm like on the day to day, I'm on the ground. <laughs> And on the ground, I see that um, white supremacist thinking is still controlling my life. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't want it not to be called white supremacist thinking because, um, because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And we have somehow gotten to a point where we consider that normal and refuse to name it. So they, those guys can handle the bigger picture. And from where I stand, I'm just trying to name the things that are um, disturbing my ability to live as a, a citizen of this United States. Yes. Hi, my name is actually Claudia too. So Hi. I was a fan before I read the book. <laughs> But um, in all seriousness, um, I appreciate the work so much, and I'm wondering what are your thoughts on the role or presence of intent uh, within racism? You have several moments in the work where you'll have white, the unnamed white characters say, uh, like, I didn't know, I didn't see you, I'm sorry, this was a mistake. Um, and so I just kind of love to hear your thoughts on just like the presence of meaning and intent I, you know, I don't, I, intent no longer is a factor for me. Mm. I think we have to deal with what is. Mm. And if we find ourselves in a situation where um, somebody's rights have been taken away, a racist comment has been made, you deal with that. Mm -hmm. We don't go back to figure out whether or not you're intended this thing to happen. It happened. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't um, go to the storm and say, "Did you intend to devastate the landscape?" <laughs> you know. So I think we have to start just dealing with what is, mm -hmm. and white people have to stop um, confusing the issues. Mm -hmm. It's not about individual feelings mm -hmm. or individual intention. It's about how the culture has arrived us here and in fact is, is pushing the white imagination into situations they don't want to be in. Mm. So if they don't want to be in, they need to start thinking about what is coming out of their mouths, wh who they're voting for. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that again? Who they're voting for. <laughs> um, and how we're ending up where we're ending up again and again. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hello, so my name is Tuesday Barnes. And um, I was born on a Thursday, just put that out. I know you were thinking it. I, I can feel it. I can feel it. Everyone thinks it. Um, <laughs> anyway, my question is, um, as a writer who is unearthing trauma and as a means to possibly heal folk, um, how do you do that and balance this almost creating trauma in the process? I don't creating know. trauma? I'm not saying creating trauma, but in the midst of unearthing or unpacking, there's almost this sense of like visibility, and so people feel hurt. So how do you heal people in that? I don't know if that's who's being traumatized in your question. Yeah. So for instance, if we're if we're unpacking like racism in America and black folk or reading these experiences, it it can read as traumatic. Um, so my question is like, in in unpacking that as a sense of healing, like how do you kind of find that balance? Well, the problem I have with your question, it, it presupposes that, there, the, that if you don't talk about it, it's not happening. And so um, to bring it to the fore, to bring it to attention means that you have some perfect life and I'm disturbing it by showing you the realities that are going on around. And I don't think that's true. I think none, for example, I know you're not specifically pointing to this video, but every moment in that video happened in the last two years, was available to you. You might say, I choose not to look at it, but it doesn't mean you're choosing not to look at it. It doesn't mean it's not happening and not traumatizing the, those families. That little girl who was screaming, and crying. How many people saw that video of that little girl? People are being traumatized. By talking about it, we're just outside of the fiction of it's not happening. Um, and that's not a fiction we should want to live in. So I, d you know, I don't think anybody's re-traumatizing anybody. I think people, um, 
I think that might be a class question as well. Like if you're able to move through spaces where the reality of these moments are not disrupting the day-to-day -day lives around you, then good for you. But those things, I, you know, I'm not bringing to the fore anything that's not daily traumatizing us as a country. And we point out the video ends in Baltimore. Yeah, yeah. The Pratt Street yeah. in Baltimore. Yes. Hi, uh, Ms. Rankin. Um, I just want to say hi, first of all. Hi. I'm, <laughs> I'm starstruck right now, but um, <laughs> so please forgive me if I ramble. But um, uh, I, uh, I know a lot of um, writers sometimes when they see uh, something incredibly like either d just big in their life uh, or that tr traumatized them in some way, they'll write it and then not share it with anyone or anything like that. And I'm not assuming that this particular incident was more traumatizing than stuff that you write about in general, but I just wanted to get your feelings on uh, how you felt in the moment that you saw the Tamir Rice video and if you wrote anything on it or, and just didn't share it or just things like that. The Tamir Rice video is actually in, mm -hmm, yeah. in, in the video. Um, I think I, I, I wrote about his mother in a piece I wrote for the New York Times um, because talk about trauma, she ended up leaving her neighborhood and going to um, a homeless shelter because she couldn't bear walking around the streets and walking past that park where her son was killed. So these moments are playing out in real time inside people's bodies and devastating families. Um, so I did write about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't in, um, it wasn't in uh, Citizen, but it was in, in the Times. If you look, if you just put in um, uh, Claudia Rank in New York Times morning, it should come up. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, hello, I'm hello. Jordan. Uh, I'm from Baltimore City. And um, I was, like, there last year. And, like, when, like, all the events that happened last year really led me to, like, like into this topic, like, advocacy. And I want to say that, like, <laughs> I just want to say, have you met other black male intellectuals in your field in a dominant in a predominantly white um society have i met other black male yeah yeah i mean is it like is it like a lot of them or is it like <laughs> <laughs> you need are you to considering come join. <laughs> queer decisions yeah okay yeah i didn't mean to come off as funny like it was an actual <laughs> no, question no 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 no, I mean, they're not, uh, you know, to be honest, I remember um, I was at a all faculty kind of, um, what was it? It was like the beginning of the year and they were welcoming faculty and they were telling us stuff about health insurance and things. <laughs> and, and I was sitting there, it wasn't at Yale, it was, I, um, in another institution. And I looked around that room and everybody was there except for black men. Everybody. And it was, it was striking to me, it was stunning. So I think, what was that? Oh. Um, so they're not as present as one would like, no. But are they there? Yes. I mean, I have a lot of um, colleagues now, but I, I, I think it's part because I'm in the AFAM department, I chose to do a joint. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's some here, too, that <laughs> look up. <laughs> Hello. 
Um, my name is Issa Ali. Um, again, thank you for your time. Um, it's beautiful that you would share your thoughts and convictions, but most importantly, your time. We appreciate that. Um, my question was in relation to something you just touched on briefly in the beginning. Um, to be a good white artist, just be white. To be a good black artist, be angry. How do you balance that anger and that like intuitive emotion to produce an accurate narrative that's also, you know, autonomous to the black experience? Because <clears throat> I know myself um, in writing and artwork, you, you sort of find yourself in a position where black existence seems as if it's in relation to white fear, white anxiety, white hatred. How do you balance that um, and still keep the narrative empowering and autonomous? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. You know, um, there's also a lot of black joy and black living that has been documented throughout. Um, and so we shouldn't forget about that. I mean, it's this prince, he's gone now, but he was pretty um, joyful. Um, I, you know, I think there, there are many ways to go at your question. As an artist, I think, and I think this is true, I think what I'm about to tell you is completely honest. There's a part of me that gets angry about certain things, yeah? But when I start working, I'm no longer in that space. I'm in the space of trying to get language or image or whatever to do the thing that I want to do in the way that I wanted to do it. And so, I spend a lot of time thinking this word or this word. So I'm not, I'm not like, I'm so angry, I can't think about this word or this word. I'm actually thinking, how do I best communicate this? Which word could hold both the history, do something musically in the line, um, and resonate in ways that have in mind what's to come. And I think it's those moments as an artist that when you arrive at that moment that gives you a kind of satisfaction, that you've managed to shape something out of nothing or go someplace with your art that you feel hasn't been entered before. So I don't think that those moments are um, necessarily fueled by anger, though the investigation might be fueled by that. But when you're working, you're working, you're just working, you know? You're just working. And, um, and you're just taking all the tools you have to make the thing you're making or to do the thing you're doing. So I wouldn't worry too much about being eclipsed out of the, the work by the feeling. The feeling will leak into the work, yeah? But, but I think that if you are truly engaged as an artist, then you're working. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> there is a reception outside in the pavilion, and Claudia has graciously agreed to do book signings for a while um, outside. Thank you again. <laughs>